Halloween, love it or hate it, you for sure have heard of it, and you probably know how it came to be. Irish refugees brought it with them to America where it was adopted and spread around the world. And you might know that this holiday is from Celtic ascent, but what you might not know is that it was also celebrated in more places than Ireland, Scotland, the Isle of Man, Brittany, and basically everywhere where the Celtics settled. And yes, that does include Spain. From the end of the Bronze Age until the Romans Romanized them, the Celtics lived in northern Spain. This means that Celtic mythology had time to settle and influence the people of these lands for generations up to this day. So today I will try to illustrate you about all of the mythology that has historically been found in Galicia. But before I start, I need to give a little disclaimer. Galician mythology has been created in three phases. The Celtic one, where the basis for it were laid, a medieval phase, where the established mythology was Christianized and expanded, and the Resurdimento, which was a period where Galician writers and artists recovered the Celtic traditional mythology and idealized it. This means that you will find histories that seem like they come from the deepest forest of Ireland, and others that seem like they were written like fan fiction, because they were. Religious fanfiction, the best kind. So let's start with explaining. While on the topic of festivities, let me tell you more about Halloween, originally called Samain. Celebrated, of course, from the 9th of the 31st October to the 1st of November, it marked the end of the harvest season. It acts as the Celtic New Year and it has a tradition of putting on masks and going from house to house asking for food while reciting poetry. Sound familiar? Another tradition that didn't quite make it to Halloween was starting campfires that were believed to have purifying and protecting powers. These campfires could only be made with a specific type of wood and they were also used to see the future. The ritual could go something like this. You make a circle of stones, one for each person participating in the ritual, and then run around the fire with a torch. If on the next morning there were stones missing, the person that the stone represented wouldn't make it past that year. Samain was also considered a time where it was easier to cross the border from the world of the living to the world of the dead. In contrast to Samain is Beltane, celebrated on the 9th of the 30th of April to the 1st of May. It marked the start of the shepherd harvest, where cattle will be guided to the green fields of the mountains. Like in Samain, people will also start on fires, but these were only for purifying and protecting not future seeking. Also, there will be a nocturnal harvest made with the light of fachucos, and after, their ashes will be spread on the fields. There isn't a lot written about Celtic gods, mainly because Celtics never develop a writing system, meaning that what little is left comes from oral history that wasn't destroyed by the Catholic Church. However, from what little is left, we can learn that one of, if not the most important gods, was Luck. He was the master of all arts and abilities. That's why he is also known as Samildanak, or the Multiple Craftsman. He gave names to many cities, but I want to talk about two. Lugo, which comes from Lucus Augusta, where Lucus means sacred forest, and Lugtinium, which derived in Londinium and later in London. Another important god from the Celtic pantheon is Berobreo, god of death and the other side. He is the one that protects that place and guides souls to their resting place. His symbols are the sea and the setting sun. And also with an infernal look, Endo Bellico, of which it is said that he was, despite its demonic looks, the god of health, nature and dreams. And it is associated with the laurel crown, the wolf and the wild pig. Other minor gods that we don't have that much info on are Pandua, related with water and goddess of homes, Beltane, the goddess to whom the Beltane festival is dedicated and that takes care of fertility and sensuality, Borbo, also related with water, he was the god of healing and hot springs, Koso, god of war, Navia, also goddess of fertility, Reva, associated with the hierarchy, justice and death, he is also strongly related to rivers, lagoons, hot springs, and finally, Sanoaba, goddess of fountains. As you can see, a lot of them developed the same function, whether as god of water, goddess of fertility, and that's probably because Celtic villages were relatively isolated, so it's pretty likely that the myths were developed in parallel to each other. As in many other European places, there are a lot of myths about creatures that cause harm or that try to explain phenomena not yet understood. As you can clearly see in the timestamps of the video, this is the densest part of our mythology, but trust me, it's also the most interesting. I'll start with the Biospardo, a made-up animal that is used to prank children and fools, and that equates to the Gamusino in other regions. To catch it, you need to go to a narrow path of a forest at night in which you can neither hear people nor animals. Those that can catch it will have good luck with the condition that they don't tell anyone that they have one. If you like dragons, you will like this one. 
The coca, it isn't related with cocaine, is a dragon that lives in the waters of rivers and near the coast. Although it had the head and body of a dragon, it had a serpent tail. Legend has it that it was killed by some young foals of Redondela after it had eaten a beautiful lady from the village. And today, if you go to Redondela, you might be lucky and catch the Festa da Coca, in which the locals regret the fight where they defeated it. And just like dragons, another monster that appears time and time again in European mythology is the werewolf. Galician werewolves are pretty similar to other European werewolves, so I will limit myself to saying that you will become a werewolf if you are the seventh or ninth son of a mother that has no daughters and your oldest brother doesn't become your godfather. Also, the only clinically documented case of lycanthropy was a Galician trans man. How cool is that? But don't think everything is monsters, there are also spirits. The Lavandeira is a ghostly apparition that you can often see near rivers or lavaderos where they will be washing, hence their name, washers, clothes stained with blood. If you pass near them, they will ask you to help them wash some clothes and if you agree to, something that you should do, as if you refuse, they'll kill you, you need to be careful to wash the clothes on the opposite direction that they are, or you will be caused with bad luck. They'll either appear on nights or full or new moon, and it is thought that they are spirits of mothers that died while giving birth, or that let their kids die without baptizing them. Another thing that you might find in the woods is a moura, it is said that they are spirits of the dead, they have magic powers and they live underground to the cold. If you find one, usually near a river washing her hair, they will offer you either a deal or a proof of courage, and if you accept or pass the test, they will reward you with good amounts of gold. But if someone ever finds out that your wealth comes from a deal with a Moura, all your gold will turn into coal and hair. Mouras also have a masculine counterpart, Mouros, but they will live underground digging and it's pretty rare to see one. Mouras were usually used to explain how big rock buildings came to be, and another thing that was usually used to explain strange phenomena were the Nubeiros. They are usually evil, anthropomorphic, and very old and ugly. Their eyes are red as embers and they have the capacity of controlling the weather. They travel from place to place on top of clouds and they are responsible for strong storms. Another scary old man is the Sacauntos, a creature that steals kids fat to eat it so it can have the same energy as them. And the last minor monster is the Urko, a giant dog that emerges from the sea full of chains and that whenever someone sees him a tragedy occurs. So now with the big ones, firstly the Diagno, a little spirit or goblin that likes to prank people, he usually takes the form of a horse, cow or any other domestic animal, even of babies sometimes, and that acts at night carrying people that walk out night when they shouldn't, disorienting the farmer that looks for its lost cattle, annoying the miller that's making floor in the moonlight, or making fun of young people that come late from a party. It's most usual prank is to offer a ride on a white donkey that once you get on will grow and grow without stopping, the horse that after a hellish ride puts the rider back where they started, jits them into the river or burns their pants, a little goat that's dying from cold and that once heated will make fun of whoever helped it, the black dog that follows the walker, a frog that's faster than a horse, and a baby that's playing naked on the snow. And of course, an infinite amount of noises, mysterious lights, and any other trick that can scare whoever they find out walking during night time. Another little devil that likes to prank people is the Trasno. You will know one has obsessed with you when you find something somewhere different from where you place it, a beloved object goes missing or a window or door closes suddenly, scaring you. They are little critters with horns, legs and goat tails. Unlike poltergeists from other cultures, Trasnos don't just live in one home and they will follow whoever they have obsessed with if they move. According to mythology, you can distract them by putting seeds somewhere in the house as they only know how to count to ten and the seeds will slip through their hands while counting. Trasnos also have a more evil version called Tardo, but it can be distracted with the same. I know all my Galician viewers are waiting for me to talk about Megas, but before I do that, first we need to talk about Brushas. A Brusha is pretty much what you think of when you think about witches, an old, ugly, and a mean lady that knows all secrets from magic and witchcraft, as well as knowing every potion in existence that they craft with big cooking pots. According to legend, their looks can make anyone who they dislike sick. Of course, they always wear black and go everywhere with their black cat and their broom that they can use for flying. You will become one of them if you are the seventh or ninth daughter of a mother with only daughters. And your oldest sister doesn't become your godmother. Pretty much like the feminine counterpart of werewolves. And probably more important about Brushas, they have the ability to undo Mega's doings and magic. So, 
What are makers? They are Brucia, whose whole intent is to harm others, and to do so, they make a deal with the dog. Unfortunately, there isn't just one type of mega, but then, those are Megas Chuchonas or Sappers. They are the most dangerous, and they will present with a lot of different faces transformed into either vampires or insects like the bumblebee. They will suck the blood of your children, they will steal fat that they use in their potions. The Bedoiras are skinny and nice to the touch, and they have an amazing ability to contact with the other side or with people that they are hanging around in the purgatory. They usually told people if their loved one were in hell or heaven. A Fetiseira is a mega that lives near the rivers and that, while old, is pretty beautiful and has an hypnotic voice that she uses to lure people into the river where they drown. The Mega de Castro is a type of mega that lives under a, well, Castro. They always wear long dresses and always attend people's petitions. As they have great amounts of wealth, no good words nor gifts will help you gain her favor. And usually she goes to attend to people that have been screwed by a hard situation in their lives. And for a quick list of all minor megas, the Asun Cordas, they spite people and watch who enters and leaves from all houses in a village. The Marimantas are the megas that go around with a sack and kidnap children. The Lobis Mujer is a mega that was born on Christmas Eve or on a Good Friday and is basically a werewolf. The Agoreira, they get all pretty quick but they also live very long, the Cartucheira, they go around seeking the future with tarot cards and never fail a prediction, and the Wadoira, they fly around doing pirates? Not very scary if you ask me. So, knowing all of this, Megas might look like a very scary monster, but don't worry, it's actually pretty easy to defend yourself. If you ever find yourself trapped in medieval Galicia, here are some tricks to not get attacked by Megas. Put a broom inside town on your house door, have a garlic, chestnut or some sort of sacred figure on a collar, have in your house either sacred tear from a graveyard or sacred laurel from Ash Wednesday, have in your possession either wolf teeth or some sort of magic stone, and finally, legend has it that if in San Juan you jump over the camp fired three times, or any number divisible by three, you will be immune for a year, although in my family we jumped ten times. And to finish this section, I will present to you the most famous piece of Galician mythology, the Santa Compagna, a lost soul's retinue dressed in all black and that roams around at night. Forming two rows, each ghost has its own candle lighted and leaves a wax smell on the air. Leading this ghostly army is an specter called Stadea. The retinue is headed by a mortal who carries a cross and a holy water bucket, and who is followed by all the souls with their candles. Candles that aren't always visible. The person leading will be a man or a woman, depending on if the patron saint of the village is a masculine saint or a female saint, and said person won't remember what they did at night during the day. And the only way to recognize those affected by the Compagna is by their strength, thinness and paleness. Each passing night, their light will become brighter and their paleness more pronounced. They aren't allowed to rest any night, so their health worsens with each passing day until they get sick without anyone knowing what's going on. This way, they are cursed until they die or they find someone else to lead the Compagna. You will note that the Santa Compagna is near because you will hear prayers, dirges and a little bell, as well as a complete lack of other sounds like animals or wind. Whenever it's near, dogs will howl and cats will flee. And while everyone can hear or smell it, only kids that have been wrongfully baptized by using only oil will have the ability to see it. There is a lot of legends about why the Santa Compagna appears, but the most common ones are to claim the soul of someone who will die soon, legend has it that whoever sees the Santa Compagna will die within a year, to remind mortals of their sins, and to announce the death of a loved one that will be leading the Compagna. There are a handful of ways to defend from it and avoid becoming the leading mortal, those being open your arms, forming a cross and saying JESUS CHRIST whenever you are being handed the cross, saying I already have a cross when the leading person tells you your turn, having both your hands full with something even if it's as tall as a stone and a stick, drawing a circle with chalk and getting inside, and finally, it is said that the Santa Compagna won't be able to do you any harm whenever you find yourself on the stairs of a Cruzeiro, which is a reason why you will be able to find so many if you come to Galicia. On top of all the critters mentioned already, Galicia has a few mythical figures, most of which were born from authors seeking to create a local mythology, which as you can guess by the length of this video they succeeded. But the two most notable exceptions are the Apalpador, the equivalent of Santa Claus who touches kids' tummies to see if they have eaten well this year, leaves a few chestnuts and presents and wishes a year full of happiness and food before leaving. And Pedro Chosco, an old man that has the task of helping kids to sleep. And to whom better to start the legendary characters than Breogan, probably the most known of them all. According to legend, he built Hercules Tower, from which he was able to see Ireland, and he is considered the father of all Galician people, which makes a lot of sense given that he had 10 children, one of them, Eith. Eith will have since birth, 
dreams with a land further away than Brigantium, the city of which no one knows its location, and when he grows up he's finally able to see that land from the Hercules Tower. Eth will go to set land with 3 ships and 30 men, and with a warning from his father to never get down his home. After lots of dangers, he finally makes it to the land he was searching for, calling it Aireen, Island, a land that's just as green and humid as his father's. The expedition will find a horrible civil war taking place in Aireen, McQuill, McGrené, and McCretch are fighting for the throne of their father, Neath. McQuill had decided to not fight for the good of his own people, but his other two brothers seem a lot more ambitious than him and didn't want to share the throne. Eth decides to help McQuill and goes with him to Fort Alec where they are attacked but come out as victorious. After this, they set a reunion with the other two brothers. Will has Eth talk for him, and without leaving his horse, he gives ideas to end the war and share the land or to reign together. However, while Eth was talking, Macrené tried to reach an agreement with Macretch to expel the Brigandians, whom they saw as invaders that wanted to make them dispose their weapons so they could conquer all of Aireen. But Macretch wanted to see how things went. Once the reunion was over, the three brothers gathered and now Macrené tried to also convince McQuill to expel the foreigners. And convinced that the three brothers were conspiring against him, Eth decided to leave that very same night. But by then, Grené had already convinced his two brothers and they all went to try and kill Eth. On the assassination attempt, Eth fell from his horse and, just as his father had told him, he died assassinated not long after. So, that is all of Galician mythology, at least as far as I could find. If you found this video interesting, please take a look at my other videos, they should be appearing around your screen now, and leave a like. From my part, I will be working hard on next month's video, which should be a lot shorter than this one. See you later!